Hello and welcome to this episode. Today let's talk about caregivers. Let's talk about the dependency that people have on caregivers who have myalgic encephalomyelitis or people that have other conditions that are identifying as having myalgic encephalomyelitis. As people know, I believe, absolutely, I, I know myalgic encephalomyelitis is a real condition because yours truly has it. But I also know a lot of people have conditions that are similar to myalgic encephalomyelitis, some of their symptoms. And as a result, they've kind of hijacked this condition as their own. A lot of people. And a lot of those people have found themselves attracted to the idea of having a caregiver. Somebody who can come in and do for them what they need to be able to do for themselves. People that can make their life a little easier. Folks, I am myself disabled well I'm actually paralyzed below the waist and I am allowed to have a caregiver I don't have to fight for it just like I'm allowed to have all the medications I want don't have to ask for them I mean they, they just give them away but you know what I do I refuse them I, how many wheelchairs do you want? I mean, how many of those little scooters do you want? You can have all of them. You know, they're more than happy to write me prescription after prescription after prescription for all this crap. And I refuse. My wife tonight, she had to go and work. She's already worked a 12-hour shift, and now she has to work another one. Like Her replacement didn't come in. And she works with disabled adults. So she has to cover these shifts tonight. So I'm home alone again, which is fine. And so I have to take care of myself. The good thing is I've always been taking care of myself. I've never been dependent on someone else. You know, yeah, when my wife's coming home, I'll send her a message and say, hey, you want to pick some up for dinner at the drive-thru? Because it's just convenient. We don't have to worry about dishes that way or, you know, anything. But for the most part, everything in my life I do for myself. I don't ring a bell, I don't, I don't do any of that stuff. I mean, I don't expect others to do for me what I'm capable of doing for myself. Do I drive? No. And there's a reason I have seizures. I'm not allowed to. I mean, technically I can, but, you know, So many of us have just, we don't realize that when you reach out and ask for help, how if you're not self-checking yourself, it becomes easier and easier and easier. And eventually, asking for help becomes routine. That is one of the most destructive things that you can do to yourself. Whether it be with myalgic encephalomyelitis or whatever conditions you may be suffering with. The more you can do for yourself, the better off you're going to be in the long term. You know, when you lay there in bed and you're not moving... You're not moving the blood. You're not releasing chemicals into your system 
that can benefit you. For so many people, they have been encouraged and, and suggested to them, do everything in your power to aggressive rest. Even if you're not tired, rest anyway. Lay there, stay there. Do not move. Do not do anything that can create a crash for you. I got news for you. I crash every friggin' day. Every day. And I do so because it's just part of the life. It's not affected me a whole lot. All I've done is I've learned how to tell when they're coming on and how to deal with them as they occur. I don't follow the Bateman Horn guidebook that says whenever you crash, you should notify your primary physician and send a group of text messages out to all your supporters. You just deal with it. I don't reach for a pill bottle. I don't reach for any of that. I just deal with it. And when my wife is supposed to come home and bring me dinner, but she can't because she now has to work because, well, we need that to survive. I just go and make myself a peanut butter and jelly sandwich without complaining. I'm not ringing a damn bell and expecting somebody else to show up in the middle of the, you know, at midnight to come do something for me. Yet, people will look at me and think, you're not as severe. Folks, there's a lot. I'm not as severe because I've chosen not to be. I am actually very quite sick. And... I'm not only sick with myalgic encephalomyelitis, actually it's sister condition, neurotoxic encephalopathy. But I am, as I've said, paralyzed below the waist. I can sort of move a little bit. Um, I can stand up and do those things. But I'm also now dealing with another problem. Um, and I became paralyzed from multiple surgeries. I've had 30 plus surgeries over the years. All of my joints are replaced. I've had prosthetic infections, which has resulted in some pretty life-threatening challenges that I deal with today. But I keep fighting forward. And I don't reach for the medication bottles. I don't reach for the pain pills. I don't reach for the excuses. I don't reach for the victims. I don't, I'm not suing the doctors for making, because I became sick from operations. I just deal with the flow. And I've learned to become comfortable doing that because that's just how I've learned to manage this challenge as well as other challenges. You know, I'm, facing the possibility of they're not quite sure whether I have Parkinson's developing or MS also possibly developing. We're running into a problem with neurologists. They refuse to have anything to do with me because of my history with them. I've said some things and been quite controversial with them over the years. I see two primary doctors. Now I see a primary doctor and I see a rheumatologist and that's the extent of my um, support system. So this Parkinson's problem, they've been trying now for almost seven months to find a neurologist group or individual that'll take on my case. And the harsh reality is I'm blacklisted. And I'm fine with that. I mean, I've made it this far. But 
this is a rheumatologist that I've had now for two years. He replaced the other one that retired, and he had heard rumors about me having problems with neurologists from not exactly from being a difficult patient, but because of my willingness to say things about them in the past and confront them in ways. So there is a blacklist out there for certain people. And I just so happen to be on that blacklist with neurologists. So... I don't really know what the future on that one's going to hold. They don't know either. Luckily, my rheumatologist is a decent fella and you know, I've always I'm, I've always been considered a decent patient. It's just I knew that these neurologists were abusing people. And I spoke up. I had been warned to I was going to need long-term care and to be careful doing this, but I did it anyway. When I see people being abused, it's, I just can't sit there and allow it to happen. Truth is, I see a lot of the people in the ME CFS community being abused by the advice they're receiving from the ME community itself. And a lot of the information you're receiving is incredibly detrimental to your well being. How that works out, I don't know. But I can tell you the more you can do for yourself from the word from the moment it happens to you when you when the acute phase happens it is so important that you take ownership of this condition and learn what you need to do to manage the condition so the condition doesn't destroy you It's kind of like somebody that becomes blind in adulthood you know what? It sucks to be blind when you're an adult. But the only chance in hell you have is to take ownership of the situation and learn how to be blind. Same thing with this condition. A lot of people, a lot of well-meaning people are not encouraging you to take ownership of this condition. They're encouraging you to delegate it to others. People that do that become prisoners of this condition. People that do that become dependent, not only on the help of others, but the medications. They become prisoners to this thing. I can't stress enough to people. You know, when your brain is screwed up because of this condition or, you know, any condition a lot of times, it's hard to think clearly. It's hard to make wise choice. It's hard to see beyond the moment. But I can tell you, if you just work at it, if you work at it on a daily basis, if you approach the challenge strategically like that, kind of like weight loss, you know, if you can work on it a little bit every day, you can get control of this. Is that going to cure you? No. But it's going to make your life more manageable so you can be independent. 
You know, that's the thing is in my life, I'm independent. I don't depend on a caregiver. Because of how I've approached the challenge of this condition as well as other conditions. This has not been the Emmy encouragement approach. And I can tell you, even though this is probably not their intent, this in itself becomes a form of abuse or neglect on their part. The MACFS community, the hierarchy people, okay? I believe in their heart they truly believe what they're doing is for the right reasons. But the reality is, a lot of them, it's about fundraising, it's about membership, it's about status, it's about a lot of things. At the end of the day, when you really look at how they have benefited you, they haven't. You know, when the movie Unrest came out in 2017, so many people had high hopes. Oh, our Savior is going to come and save us somehow. And so many of you are the same. Whitney. I didn't wait for the NIH to come save me. I didn't wait for, you know, a fundraiser drive or, you know, February or what was it? May 12th or whatever it is. Emmy Awareness Month or week or whatever it is. I took the initiative to be my own caregiver, be my own advocate. And over the years, that has paid dividends to me. I'm not a burden to my family because of my approach. How many of you can say that? I'm not a burden to my wife. I'm not a burden to my parents. Well, my dad just died last year. I'm not a burden to my children. I'm my own person. Do they all worry about me? Sure. Do they all still put up with me? Yep. I'm, I'm just who I am. And I've done that because that has been my approach. I haven't approached this challenge from a selfish standpoint like so many others. That's one thing about people with chronic conditions. Some of them can be incredibly selfish human beings. And many of them can become selfish towards their caregivers as well. Okay, well, I got another peanut butter and jelly sandwich to eat, so I'm going to do that. I will continue to make these videos, hopefully just to share ideas, understandings, and give people a who may not be so far over the cliff like a lot of you. <laughs> Maybe the people that are new to this situation give you a little heads up to what to look out for. Because when I first got sick, I could have really used that myself. You know, it's a lonely place to be in that ER when the doctors aren't listening. And you're having a hell of a time explaining what's going on because you yourself don't know what's actually occurred. Well, in my case I did, but... You know, when you've had a... Like somebody that's had a stroke and they're barking at them, tell us what happened, tell us what happened. <laughs> and the person with the stroke really can't. Well, that's what a lot of us are 
that's our situation when we wind up in the ER. And that is interpreted by the medical community quite often as being uncooperative, being deceptive, being a non-participant. One thing I've always been is a participant in my own care. Okay. Please be careful. Please be careful. It is a very, very slippery slope. 